This is a mousetrap car. It's a common project that you're likely to see in schools for the very simple reason that it's excellent for demonstrating a whole bunch of different concepts in physics. We can use the mousetrap car to talk about simple machines. We have wheels and axles. We have levers. You can use it to talk about mechanical advantage. We can use it to talk about potential energy since we are storing energy in this mousetrap spring, which wants to have this little lever arm pointing forwards, but has it currently bent out of shape so that the moment it's released, it's going to move back into position. Um, and kinetic energy, which is the energy of motion. So we can use this mousetrap to turn stored energy into the energy of motion. Uh, it's also great for talking about things like energy efficiency and how if you can manage to reduce friction, you can get a better result. But today, we're going to use it to talk about Newton's three laws. So before we get started, let's take a moment and review how this thing actually works. We have this mousetrap car. It has a mousetrap set into the front of it. You'll notice that the mouse is facing forward. That's probably how you want to set things up. At this spring, there's two bits of metal, one that goes towards the back and one that heads towards the front. And on that piece of metal that's headed towards the front, I've actually just drilled a hole in this wooden dowel and slipped that wooden dowel onto this spring. That means that if the spring moves, this wooden dowel will move with it. At the end of the wooden dowel, we have the string tied to it. And that string heads all the way back to the rear axle of this machine. The basic idea is that I can wind up this car and as I do so, I'll be bending that spring out of position and storing energy in it. So let's just take a moment here while I wind this car up. So as I do this, that spring is being pulled out of position and I'm storing energy in it. And I can wind this thing all the way up until it is fully in position like this. Now what's gonna happen is if I release this, that end of the mousetrap spring is gonna slam back into position. But as it does so, it has to move this whole lever with it. So this lever has to move all the way back to the other side. And as the lever moves, it's pulling on the string which pulls on the axle. So basically, this lever is going to be pulling on that axle, causing the axle to spin. And the axle, of course, is going to spin the wheels, uh, and that is how this thing is going to move. You can see if I let it go, it immediately wants to move forward. So let's start with Newton's first law. Newton's first law says an object in motion will remain in motion and an object at rest will remain at rest until an unbalanced force is applied. So here, right now, this is an object at rest because I'm balancing out the forces, right? We're keeping this still. Uh, I'm holding it back currently, even though this wants to pull on it. If I let go, then we'll have an unbalanced force, right? The string is gonna pull on the axle, the axle is gonna move the wheels, the wheels are gonna drive this forward. So we'll have an unbalanced force that is causing this to move forwards. Now, that's getting it started. The second way in which Newton's first law applies is once this thing has actually finished uh, applying all the force it can, once the string is fully unwound, then it's an object in motion. And objects in motion are going to want to continue to be in motion, which means they are going to effectively coast. So even after I have run out of all the energy that is in this spring, because this car is an object in motion, it should be able to continue to move forward. That's the coasting phase of the mousetrap car. So the question then is, are there unbalanced forces in play? So we have two main forces that are gonna come into play that might unbalance our object in motion 
causing it to slow down. The biggest one is friction. Friction comes to play at two points. First, there's going to be a little bit of friction between the wheels and the ground. But more importantly, there's going to be friction between the axle and the body of the car itself. So basically, as this thing spins, the wood of the axle is going to be grinding up against your car. You can also end up in situations where the string sort of slides in there and gets caught, creating really a lot of friction. That could actually be enough to stop your car entirely. So our goal should be reducing friction in order to stop this extra force from slowing down our car and keeping it from coasting. Now, there is actually a formula for friction that you can learn. The formula for friction is the force of friction is going to be equal to this thing right here is something that we call the coefficient of friction. It basically is determined by what substances you have. So for example, you're going to have more friction with carpet than you are with linoleum or cement. You'll have more friction with a piece of yarn than you would with a piece of fishing wire. So basically this thing is just determined by what your materials are. Uh, and then lastly, you have the normal force. So friction is going to be equal to the materials that you're using. This is determines one aspect of this, multiplied by the normal force. So the normal force, if you remember your physics, is the force that opposes gravity whenever something is sitting on a surface. That means that the normal force is going to be equal to an object's weight. So the first and simplest thing that we can do to reduce friction is to reduce this object's weight. The more lightweight you make your car, the less friction there is going to be. The second thing you can do to reduce friction is to think about the materials that you are using. Are you using something that really easily catches and rubs? Are you using a lubricant like graphite? Things like ball bearings or aspects that can act, reduce friction right at that point where the wheels are touching the body can make a huge difference in how far your mousetrap car goes. Basically, you're bleeding out energy whenever you have friction. That's energy that isn't making it from your mousetrap into making your car go forwards. And you wanna stop that whenever you can. Now, the second force that's gonna come into play that might stop your car from coasting, that could be that unbalanced force that keeps your car from being this object in motion, is drag, also known as air resistance. So we've talked about air resistance. Air resistance is basically the force of all that air that your car is hitting as it moves. Now the important thing to understand about this is that the faster your car is moving, the more air particles it's hitting every moment. And that means that drag is actually really easy to reduce. The biggest thing that you can do to reduce drag on your car is have it move slower. If your car is just creeping along, if it's moving really, really slowly, then you're gonna have a lot less air resistance than if you try to make it move really fast. So if you're aiming for a distance car, a car that travels as far as possible, that's really using every bit of energy in that mousetrap spring to make it go farther, then one of the most important things you can do is you can make that car travel super, super slow. The slower it's going, the longer it's actually gonna be able to keep coasting because it's not gonna be losing that energy to air resistance. Okay. Now let's take a moment to talk about Newton's second law. Newton's second law tells us that force equals mass times acceleration. That is a math formula, but we don't always have to think about these things as math problems. The important thing to remember here is that if you have more force, you can get more mass to move and you can make it accelerate more. If you have more mass, it's gonna take more force to make it move. If you have more acceleration, it's gonna take more force to make it move. And the less mass you have, the more acceleration you can get. So basically, these three things are intimately connected. Now, we are in a situation where we want our car to be moving. We don't necessarily want it to be moving fast. We just need to get a big distance out of it. Now, when we start talking about energy, you're going to learn that the amount of energy that you can get out of a system is equal to the force you put on it, multiplied by the distance that it travels. 
Um, so you can think about the mouse trap. The mouse trap has a lot of force. You just had that spring slamming down, uh, but it only travels a really small distance. In comparison, the wheels have a much bigger area. So for every one rotation of the wheels, that's traveling pretty far. It's a bigger distance, but there's a lot less force happening at that edge. That's really what we want. We want to be able to use a small amount of force to get a big distance. But we have a problem there because we still need to be able to make our car accelerate. So we're trying to use a really small force and still get acceleration out of it. So if we think about Newton's second law, we still want to be able to accelerate, but we want this force to be small. If this force is going to be small, the only way we can make that work is if we decrease the mass. Right? Force and mass are directly correlated. If you increase the force, you can move more mass. If you decrease the mass, you need less force. So with less mass, you can make this car accelerate with a smaller force, which is gonna be really important for those distance cars. At the same time, if you are doing a speed-based car, you still want less mass, because with less mass, you're gonna be able to get more acceleration with however much force you put into this. So no matter what kind of car you are building, one of your key principles should be keeping it lightweight, because with less mass, you can get more acceleration no matter how much force you're putting in. Finally, let's talk about Newton's third law. Newton's third law says every action has an equal and opposite reaction. When we've talked about this in class, we've talked about how, the, how you don't actually propel yourself through the world so much as you push and pull on other things, which then push and pull on you in response. When you take a step, you're literally pushing the world backwards, and it's the world that pushes you forwards. The same is true for these cars. What's happening as these things move is the wheels are pushing backwards on the earth, and the earth responds by pushing the car forwards. Now what this boils down to is the car can't move unless the wheels are actually pushing on the earth. That should sound fairly obvious that you need to have the car actually on the ground in order for it to move, but remember, Oftentimes what ends up happening is that mousetrap spring can be so powerful that if you have a shorter lever, you might actually end up with a situation where your wheels effectively spin out, which means they're just spinning in air instead of actually pushing on the ground. If that happens, all that energy from that mousetrap spring is being wasted on spinning the, the wheels in the air and it's not actually being used to propel your car forwards. So the last thing to think about is the traction of your wheels. If you have a situation where your wheels are really slippery and slanted against the ground, they might just spin out. This is particularly a problem for those speed-based cars. If you are building a car for speed, you really need to think about the substance that your wheels are made of. Is there anything you can do to make those wheels a little bit grippier so they're not just gonna spin out when they're on the ground? And there's lots of different things that people have tried to do this. I've seen folks cover the edges of the wheels in rubber bands. I've seen folks take bits of rubber and wrap it, wrap it around them. Um, I've seen folks use foam rather than just the simple CDs. Uh, but if you're using really smooth wheels, then they might just completely spin out. And that's going to waste all your energy and not let your car move forward. So to reiterate, we have three of Newton's laws. Newton's first law, an object in motion remains in motion and an object at rest remains at rest until an unbalanced force is applied. This matters because we really care about keeping that object in motion, in motion. We want that car to coast. That means reducing those unbalanced forces that might be slowing it down, like air resistance and friction. Newton's second law tells us that force equals mass times acceleration. If you want that car to accelerate more with the same amount of force, you need to lower your car's mass, make it lightweight. And finally, for Newton's third law, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Your car's wheels need to be able to push on the earth. That means they need enough traction to be able to do that and not spin out. And that's how all of Newton's laws affect a mousetrap car.